Welcome, this is Holly Drake. Thank you for joining me in my kitchen. Today we're gonna to have an incredible class on edible flowers. It's raining and I had to get these edible flowers to show you uh, for my demonstration today. I was visiting with a friend yesterday and she said, Holly, how did you learn as much as you have? And I have had mentors, I have had instruction, I have hundreds of books, I do search the web, I. I do those things, but I think the reason why I've learned so deeply is because I wallow in the plants. And I'm just encouraging you to join me and do that with me. Um, if you learn that something is edible, like these yucca flowers, then go find some yucca flowers and eat them. Um, if you find that elderflower makes an amazing witch hazel spray for your face, then infuse some. And um, when you learn about lamb's quarter, then go find it. and harvest it and make sure it's, you know, follow all of the foraging guidelines that I've taught you, but then eat it and then share it with others and spread the wildfire. So that's the key to wild success is just really um, embracing the plant and getting to know it. It's the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing what it's medicinal for and what it's edible for and how you, how it's useful and practical and and appreciating, of course, its beauty. Okay, I wanted to share with you that I had a, um, a wild food forage to feast on Saturday night, so we're getting back into that again. This time it was for Lisa Ennis's birthday party, and it was so much fun. And so she and Brian and Abigail Button and I went foraging in the morning, and we came back with tons of things, and then we put together a Mexican fiesta for our friends that night, and it was magical. Herbing around that I'm doing right now is I'm taking yucca flowers, and for dinner, Jason and I are gonna have it's yucca alfredo. And so you just take the flowers off of the stamens and the sepals and the sexual parts. We don't want those, and we're just gonna take the petals. And um, that's the part that I'm gonna be boiling for 10 minutes, and then I'm gonna make an alfredo sauce with, uh, this is garlic butter made with ramps and wild garlic from back in the um, in the early spring. So it's been frozen. I'll take two tablespoons of that, melt it in a pan, and then I'm going to add to that some half and half, or you can use oat milk if you are dairy free. And then to that you add Parmesan cheese, salt and pepper, and maybe some basil, uh, fresh basil or parsley or whatever you'd like. So you just cook these as if they're actually noodles and they absolutely have an amazing texture. They can be fried. I have never tried that, but I intend to. I got quite a, um, a stash of them and I'm excited about pickling them and doing some of the things that I've never done before. So in this little bowl here, I'm putting the buds, the flower buds, because those two are edible. They have much more of a crunch factor. You kind of want to have them a little further along like this one here. If they're too far along, then you have to open them up and get out the stamens and the ovaries and stuff as well. But this one's just pretty young, so I'll throw that in. So I'm going to go ahead and put these into the water, which is boiling, and set the timer for 10 minutes. Here, do you see? You see those flower petals? Are they beautiful? You can eat them uh, raw, but they'll kind of make a little scratchiness in the back of your throat. They're much better boiled or fried, which I'm gonna try this week. I'm so interested in just exploring this plant. When we talk about chicories, we'll talk about forcing chicons. We'll have some uh, poke for dinner as well, and then I have some leftover chicken, so that's kind of our dinner. I'm gonna be garnishing with edible flowers because that's what our talk is on tonight. So I've got my noodles done. And my butter is almost done. I'm going to get a strainer out. My little milk cow has some oat milk in it, compound butter, until everything's melted and nice and warm. And then I'm going to add the Parmesan cheese. So now I'm going to take my noodles or my yucca flowers and just put them right into the Alfredo sauce. That looks kind of like noodles, don't you think? Sure, it does. So Where's Max? I don't know. Is he outside? No, he's not outside. I have a lot of options here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. What do I want to do? I know what I want to do. These are so cool. These, uh, Brian taught me about these. These are vetch. Um, this is not crown vetch. He had another name for it. But it's also in the legume family. And they taste amazing. And I found these at the Green Valley Park. 
And I said, Brian, what is that beautiful purple flower? And he was just eating them like crazy and I'm popping them in my mouth and they were super sweet and they taste just like green beans. So they're also, like I said, in the Fabiaceae family and so, so, so good. And so then I think what I'll do is just add, just because, because we can, add a little bit of that. Wait, wait, wait. Well, I, I don't... I want to add just a couple I more. I want to taste the, uh, the actual uh, Well, can they entree. see how pretty it looks? Well, certainly if they can... Yeah, and that look nice? Yeah, a lot of color and there's some, you know, the nice texture and... That is, mm, cheese on me. Anything with Parmesan good. cheese or bacon yes, is yes. you can't lose. Surprisingly, surprisingly good. Please try. Oh my gosh, my stomach's growling. Mm. No, no, you can have the rest. We'll have, no. We're going to have it for dinner. It has a lemony flavor. Why, um, why would it have a lemony flavor? Just a, oh, because I put lemon in the compound butter. That's yeah, why. Yeah, probably a slight lemony flavor. You, yeah. You'd like to try it? Okay, I'll just take you a gotta, bite. you got to be able to tell them what it tastes like. Look how like. pretty that looks. So I think when you decorate with edible flowers, it actually makes it more alluring. It's, yeah, it's warm enough. I think mm. it's quite quite good. It's got a very wow. smooth and mild taste. And it's got little hints of taste that make mm. it good. That is so good. Now, you didn't even use cream. You didn't use... I any, used oat milk. You used oat milk, which makes it much lighter and it's right. non-dairy. Right, so those of you that are non-dairy or gluten-free, knock yourself out. Yeah. So this is, well, you good. probably want to eat the rest. I'll finish it. Okay. So that's exciting. And I also learned something absolutely astounding this week, and I'm so excited about it. Um, this is, you guys recognize this? Remember we did an entire hour class on poke? And this is pokeweed, and it has such a um, bad reputation. But it is a toxic plant, and there's Remember, we spent a whole hour on it, and there's a lot of caveats as to how to prepare the food and so um, to make it food and make it edible. And so I learned just this week, and I'm going to put this in the comments below, the, the link that I was watching. One of my favorite foragers, Haphazard Homestead, her name is Holly as well, and she was talking about how she uses, has ever since she's a child, she uses all of the leaves even with a tall plant, as long as they're as glorious looking as this one. So as long as they're growing and they're light green and they're healthy looking um, and the bugs haven't come yet, even though the stem is red, you're not going to eat the stem at this point, obviously, but you will get a mess of greens out of these large greens. And I've always been super tentative about that and have only ever eaten the short ones that are like 10 or 12 inches tall with the young leaves. But that just gives you a short window and I wanted to see, well, how did the South stay alive during the Civil War if all they had was poke available for a couple of weeks in May? And it's because they foraged the whole bush clear up to uh, the fall. And you can even force the roots to create more leaves in the winter, which is a whole other class. So I made a red clover tea, and I dried the flowers from last year's harvest, and the red clovers are out a lot right now. So you want to get them when they're at the peak of their energy and they're bright and purple and beautiful. And I know that the white ones some people eat, but I don't prefer those at all, the white clover. I really like the um, Trifolium pretense, which is the purple ones. And they are also in the Fabiaceae family, which is the legume family or the pea family. And so Jason, this is for you, hon. All right. I sweetened it with milkweed uh, honey, so. Let me know what you think. This is actually a specific for female issues. It's got a phytoestrogen in it. And so this is an amazing tea to drink uh, if you've got any type of female issues, delicious as well. So what do you think? It's a, it's a very mild and very tasty tea. Yeah. It is. It's a blood thinner though, so be careful. If you're on blood thinners, you don't want to be drinking red clover tea or consuming red clover because it is a powerful blood thinner. So if I needed my blood thinned. I have about eight things I would do is like cayenne and drinking a lot of water and the red clover. However, if you're on those, that's what your doctors put you on, I would stay away from red clover. Just letting you know. The scripture that I wanted to share with you is this. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And when I look at these flowers, I can't help but smile. They're just like 
there, it's like the earth is laughing with uh, flowers and it's God's gift to us, but they're not the goal. They're not the end goal. When I went out of town to go be with my brother and see my niece graduate and go up to New York City to be with my son and help him get into his apartment, all of that was great, but I was so sad because I missed a lot of my plants that I'd been waiting and waiting, watching them bud and waiting for them to bloom because it's so spectacular, but it's so fleeting and it's, um, it's got a purpose. So these flowers are basically for the purpose of attracting pollinators so that the main goal is it's all about sex, you guys. It's all about going to seed. It's just, it's all about keeping the life going. And so um, the reason why flowers are so beautiful and so attractive is because it's attracting the pollinators so that they will be pollinated and fertilized and then the oval will grow into a beautiful berry or a seed pod and then the seeds will be spread in all those ingenious ways that we studied back in March. The thing that attracts the bees and the pollinators is the pollen and that is magic. And so we love the honey and the things that the bees do with the pollen, but um, it's also good for us. Sometimes people have an allergy to pollens and so be careful with that but I love the pollen in my elderflowers. I've been cooking with elderflower all week. It's been absolutely amazing, and it's the pollen that adds that amazing flavor. You might mention the apples and the uh, plums we've got next door. Yeah, absolutely. So the apples and the plums, they're in the rosaceae family, and any one of the flowers in the rosaceae family are edible when they're flowers. Just remember that when you take a flower, you're not getting that fruit from that flower that would have become a fruit. So it's a, it's a give and take. Oh, I wanted to talk about green wallpaper. So everything is green. <laughs> and I think the reason why I went crazy is because every single plant goes to flower. It all buds and blooms. And so there's millions of them out there. And so I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I wanna share all of the edible flowers. You, got, you can't just know my top 10 or my top five because I love them all and there's some I haven't even tried yet that I've, I've studied about preparing for this class that I cannot wait to experience. So um, let me know when I share in the um, slideshow if you've tried some of the ones that I have yet to try. So the green wallpaper, this is from the Botany in a Day book by Tom Elfell. And he says that everything is kind of like this green wallpaper and it all looks the same unless you're Holly Drake or one of my students that's crazy about knowing every plant in its life cycle. But that green, when it goes to flower, pops and it just says, here I am. I'm a black eyed Susan. I'm a daylily. I'm a, um, a, a oxide daisy or a pansy or a rose. And all of those flowers are what we are the most familiar with. So it's the easiest way to identify a mysterious plant is to wait for it to go to flower. So I have a plant right now in my vegetable factory garden and I didn't plant a garden this year which is so sad but I just thought well I'll just let come up whatever wants to come up and what came up are about 80 I would say well maybe 40 of a mystery plant and I don't have that app that you all have on your phone I need to have one of you come over and identify it for me but I'm just kind of waiting for it to go to flower so I can figure out what the heck it is and I'm kind of hoping it's a blue lobelia and um, because I love blue and of course I don't really want it to go to seed there because that's going to be where it's not edible it's just beautiful I really don't want that in my my vegetable garden so I'll move it after I figure out what it is but it's just kind of that's what most people are familiar with are the flowers and that's the easiest way to identify them Next year, if you stick with me that long, we'll be getting into botany and I'll teach you about the eight families, the most famous families in the plant world, and how they all have similar characteristics that will help you to identify, and we'll get into how to key out things as well. So, um, but that's for next year. But it really does help because if you know something's in the rosaceae family or in the, or the mustard family, you know that all of their flowers are edible. So that's kind of cool. And roses have five petals, and mustards have four petals. 
So not all flowers that have five or four petals are in either of those families, but it's just a general rule. Buds are the preview of what's coming, and a lot of flower buds are edible, and some aren't. <laughs> so it's kind of like God's in the details, and that's kind of fun to really know a plant at every single stage of its life cycle and look forward to anticipation of what's going to come. Some do's and don'ts I want to share with you that are on the back of the handout that um, is right here is always shake off the flowers to remove bugs. And this is kind of interesting. The yucca has this little moth that lives in some of the blossoms and it makes it the blossoms into a house. And so when I put this into my car just now, all these little moths, I had to shake it so that the moths would leave before they went inside my car. But as I was even working just now, I had um, a few of those little white moths coming out and saying hi. So um, I always make sure you shake them out before you start using them for garnishing in particular because you might be having a high tea with garnished uh, beautiful edible flowers and then having little bugs crawling across your cream cheese or whatever you've done um, would not be all that attractive. One way you can do that is by putting your flowers on a white sheet in the sun just for a few minutes and it'll just cause those bugs that are hiding in there to just escape because they don't like that uh, brightness and they will run and scamper away. All right, removing the pistils and the stamens from the flowers before eating and that's what I was just doing here and the reason why is because they're super, super bitter and uh, that's not something that you're gonna be find very compelling. Separate the flower petals from the rest of the flower just prior to using them to keep them from wilting. So one of my hints in foraging with wild um, for edible flowers is filled with water in a box in the back of, in, in my car. And so when I went and collected flowers, I immediately put them into the water because if you don't, they just get so traumatized. And by the time you get home, they're just a mess. And then I'm gonna use these for, not just for beauty and for giving as gifts, but also for garnishing. And so what you do is you just keep them on your counter and your edible flowers that you want to garnish with and just keep them in water so that they are really happy until it's time to display them and use them for cooking or for garnishing. And so I'll take off these petals right here and these can go into, this is the Black Eyed Susan, and these can go directly into a salad or into a honeyed cheese log or whatever just for the color. It doesn't really have much flavor, but you don't want to eat the, this is the, the um, composite part of the ray flowers. This is a ray flower in the Asteraceae family. So this is just really not tasty at all. And so this just goes in my compost bin. Um, pick the flowers in the morning when their water content is the highest. And you wanna wait until you know nine o'clock or so Well, the dew has been burned off and everything is fresh and um, before it gets too hot. And I'm also, I don't like to forage when it's hot. I tend to like to get up early and be out there just at the right time where I'm not fading either. And then some don'ts. Don't collect flowers by the side of the road to eat and don't eat flowers from florists, garden centers, or nurseries because they use pesticides and sometimes they use chemicals to preserve the flowers for a, an ordinary period of time. And those chemicals and pesticides are really toxic. So just be sure that if you're going to eat roses that you've harvested them and you found them yourself in a, or you grew them yourself in a lovely, um, healthy place. And then don't consume large quantities of flowers. Sometimes people have allergic reactions, so you're gonna to wanna to test that. And then don't steep a flower tea for longer than five minutes or it will become bitter. All right, so I'm gonna go over to my computer and I've got the most amazing slideshow for you. We're gonna talk about the language of flowers, <laughs> which is fascinating. Flowers are one of the most vibrant reminders of God's glory, his artistry, fragile, and they're so fleeting. They're full of color and aromas with all inspiring array of shapes and sizes. They look good enough to eat and many of them are indeed edible. This is that handout I was telling you about on my Patreon site. This is a list of many of my favorite edible flowers. Many of them grow wild, and some are cultivated in gardens. Others are vegetable flowers, tree flowers, fruit flowers, and herb flowers. And back of this handout has a few ideas on how to use edible flowers in cooking, 
garnishing and for healing properties. The language of flowers is fascinating. Did you know that the flowers you give as gifts could be sending a secret message? Flowers have a language of their own. The Victorians made an art of it. Perhaps you've heard about Victorian women carrying small bouquets called tussy mussies. These bouquets were not just for show or scent. The flowers in them were chosen for the messages encoded in them. For example, um, strands of ivy signified fidelity and friendship, and gardenias conveyed a secret love, and forsythias was anticipation. Shakespeare used the meaning of flowers to enhance his storylines, as in Hamlet, when poor Ophelia laments, there's rosemary, that's for remembrance, pray love remember, and there is pansies, and that's for thoughts. Even dashing Leopold in the movie Kate and Leopold knew better than to send a woman orange lilies. Okay, I'll have to give the credit to that quote down in the comments. So listen to this uh, poem that was written in 1875 called The Language of Flowers. There is a language little known, lovers claim it as their own. Its symbols smile upon the land wrought by nature's wondrous hand and in their silent beauty speak of life and joy to those who seek for love divine in sunny hours in the language of the flowers. So we'll be going over as many of the plants that I could find their language, what they represent in this presentation. But first I want to talk about some creative ways to use uh, flowers and even to preserve them. So one of my favorite ways is to make flower ice cubes with edible flowers. And I just wanted to make a caveat really quick because I forgot to tell you and I always warn you that there are a lot of poisonous flowers and we will do a class on poisonous plants after we finish this flower series. We can put them in flower ice cubes. There's ways to do that. I've written about that on the back of my handout. You can crystallize them in sugar to use for decorations on bakery goods, or you can encrust them in cheese and butter. Aren't these beautiful? These are not my photos, but they are amazing. Okay, this is my photos and from here on. So here are forsythias for garnishing, and over on the right is my Mediterranean wild food feast that I did with um, in 2017 with Mark Williams, and it was amazing. So look at all of those flowers that are garnishing. I'm garnishing just my wild wontons with some bachelor buttons on the right. And you can garnish cocktails. You can put them in salads. It makes any dish pop with joy. So I love daylilies. They taste like sweet, sweet lettuce. And so they add color and crunch and flavor and even nutrition. I've made some fritters with uh, cooking with flowers and cooking with dandelion blossoms. You honestly have to keep them in water until the very second you're going to dip, dip them in batter because they will close up. You can also put edible flowers on a cake. This is Sojourner right on the right hand side, Shambay's beautiful sister. Look at how beautiful those cakes look with just some beautiful flowers and she decorated them. You can use them in oils or vinegars and I've been doing that all week because I've got plans. And you can infuse flowers for wild drinks, locust blossoms a whole bunch of dandelion to make dandelion wine or soda or any type of drink. And so here's a lineup of some of my drinks. The rose flowers and the bee balm and the goldenrod are the only ones that are flowers. The pine is made with the needles, the dandelion is made with the roots, and the sumac is made with the berries. You can use edible flowers for making gems and jellies. So this is violet jelly, this is dandelion jelly on the middle, and this is a rose jam on the right. You can infuse flowers for wild syrups, the elderflower cordial, and you need to make that before you can make elderflower cakes, elderflower watermelon slushies. Whatever you cook with elderflowers, you have to make the cordial first. And so I've got recipes for that coming out for my Patreon members. So excited. You can flavor honeys and sugars and salts, even um, this is Epsom salts. This is from the Nerdy Farm Wife, and I thought this was amazing how she put the rose petals into the Epsom salts for a, a delicious bath, and she probably added some essential oil as well, which certainly I would do. And then I found this trick for drying flowers that really, really works. I've got this really nice kind of flat basket, and I put my elder flowers in there, and I stuck it on the dashboard in my car on a hot afternoon, and within an hour, maybe two, they were nice and perfect. 
And it's bad to make um, teas out of dried plant material. I'm not really sure why that is. If anyone knows, please comment because I would be curious to know why that is. But the picture on the right, my dear friend Pamela collected these apple blossoms. There's some violets I can see and maybe those are locust flowers, I'm not sure. And then the red bud flowers. And then she made that into a delicious tea. You can make them into bouquets and follow nature's way. All of my bouquets, starting from the very beginning with the daffodils, even though those are not edible, um, all year long, I'm always having flowers as a centerpiece or to give away. And it's kind of fun to see what comes up as nature's wave is constantly shifting. So the spring on the left, summer in the middle, and fall on the right. And you can play with flowers. So making tiaras is a lot of fun. Allison Dees made this beautiful flower crown for Lisa for her birthday on Saturday night. And I made her elderflower ice cream with coconut milk, which was amazing, with chocolate. Or you can dry flowers for crafts. I think, yeah, so these were all ferns. You can hold it. That was Queen Anne's lace. Mm -hmm. And I think, wait, this is also, that was the, that was the leaf though, and this is the flower. Mm -hmm. uh, this, these oh, are separate leaves of the Wow, this is the best thing you've ever made. <laughs> yeah, it, it might actually be. Let's talk about food because I'm always so food centric. Um, the buds come before the flowers. So these are the dandelion buds and they come up very low to the ground, um, but they are delicious. And from these buds make things like what I've got on the right. And so the nutrition in these guys are amazing. And dandelions, when they first open, um, the first time after they've been in that tight bud and then they close and then they open and they close, they do that five times and then they become that little seed globe that we love to blow on. So really you want to collect the buds before they've opened the first time to get the best chew factor and the best nutrition. And so that is amazing. And what I love to do with that is just to steam them a little bit and then saute them in bacon grease with a little bit of feta cheese and maybe squeeze a lemon and some salt. Oh, you could see bacon in there too, which is always good. Here's the buds I was talking about earlier. Look at that. What color do you see? Do you see pink? I know it doesn't look like it, but it's there. So it's kind of like we need to learn patience, right? Like we want our banana to turn yellow right away. But you know what? It's just a matter of being patient. And you, know, the more you spend time in nature following its wave and waiting patiently for the next stage, it always happens because God is faithful. And then I wanted to talk about loop looking because the, the more I wonder, the more I love and the more I know I am loved. So I'm going to read to you what it says on the private eye website about loop looking. And if you guys don't have a loop yet, I, also, I really recommend purchasing one and I'll give you the link below. Taking the time to appreciate the artistry of each flower, look at things that few ever really truly get to appreciate, like diving down the throat of an iris, for example. It makes the world of small large. It makes the previously invisible visible. Its secret is that a loop cuts out the rest of the world. It cuts out competing visual distractions, which increases drama and wonder and concentration. I mean, don't we need that for heaven's sakes, especially now we're so um, pulled in every direction and fragmented. Its secret is also that it makes the world slightly strange and fresh. The loop helps strip a thing of its cliché, its stereotyped image, so that a real discovery can begin. A loop gives the ordinary person the heightened visual sensitivity of the artist, the writer, the scientist. Close observation mixed with wonder is essential for the development of artist, scientist, writer, as well as mathematician, humorist, inventor, and more. What else? The goal is going to seed is what we talked about. And we talked about the green wallpaper and my foraging tips. So I think that's really helpful. And we did our do's and don'ts. I hope this has been fascinating to you. I hope you go and try 
all of these ideas and if you really want it to stick if the things you're learning you want it to become a part of who you are just do it so that's part of your field work so let's just go over that really quick before i say goodbye so um, i want you to identify and gather garnish or cook with edible flowers this week um, and then make a, a flower tiara and post pictures of that on Facebook. Um, I've got a memory poster that I'll be posting on our Facebook group for the scripture that says the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So print that out and then you can use packing tape to put edible flowers down on there. You can't have any of the um, the thick parts, it must be just the petals because the thick parts you can't get the tape to flatten and so it'll just turn brown and oxidize. Make it beautiful, make your scripture poster something that represents all the edible flowers that you have around you. And then um, eat wild every day, that's always an assignment, and then get a jeweler's loop. So if you don't have a jeweler's loop, go get one because the more you wonder, the more you love, and the more you know that you are loved. So thank you for joining me.